everybody, my name is Leon, and in this video I want to show you a simple way to do something cool. We're going to learn how to unlock a car by utilizing a replay attack and some frequency jamming. First, let's take a look at the equipment we are going to use. And no, not all of this. Although we could use some of those things, we're going to use more simplified equipment. We'll need a computer, a Raspberry Pi, an RF trans receiver, an antenna, a copper cable, and of course a hoodie and some sunglasses for the hacker look. Now, this might seem like a normal thing to happen. The person tried to unlock his car, but it didn't work. Maybe the key's battery died or something. However, this was not the case. While the guy was trying to unlock his car, I had a device hidden nearby that was jamming the radio frequency of 433, the common frequency used by car keys to send the unlock codes to the car itself. While the codes that were sent from the keys were jammed and could not reach the car, another device a receiver was recording those keys for later use. So guess what now? We can now wait for the guy to return to execute our second phase of the attack. Now that the guy has returned, we can check on his car and see whether it is locked. It is locked. However, we have our set of recorded codes that we can use to unlock the car. We'll use a simple program that retransmits the previously recorded keys. This works the same way as using the actual physical keys. All we have to do is execute the program that will retransmit over radio frequency the codes as if they were sent from the keys. Let's execute the program. And now the car should be unlocked. Voila! Now that the car is open, we can retrace our steps and explain exactly what was done in order to do it. This type of an attack is called a replay attack, and it is very common in the radio frequency field. The radio frequency is being recorded and then retransmitting containing the data sent from the original sender. This works in many RF devices. However, in cars they did something special. They added a few defense mechanisms, such as rolling codes. What rolling codes mean is that the different code is being sent every time, and if a code was previously recorded by the car, then it will no longer be valid. In order to bypass this defense mechanism, we're going to use a Raspberry Pi in order to perform some frequency jamming. Using frequency jamming will allow us to block certain codes from reaching the car, and then we can reuse them. Now, the first thing you want to do is get yourself a Raspberry Pi with the default Raspbian image. We could also use the Kali Linux image for Raspberry, however, it is inconsistent with the software we're about to use. 
what we're going to do with the Raspberry is use it to retransmit a signal on the 433 frequency and jam the car codes being sent to the car. In order to do so, we're going to use the RPITX software available on GitHub. Now, this package is capable of generating and transmitting radio frequencies using the Raspberry Pi pins located on the device itself. You can download the program onto the Pi by performing a git clone of the repository. Once the repository is cloned, you can enter it and execute the default installation script attached. Now, the installation will download a few files in order for the construction of the RPITX package. As soon as the installation process completed, a few binaries will be added The process may take some time, so wait patiently. After the installation, you might need to reboot the device. Now, while the Pi reboots, let's take a look using GQRX at what happens when data is being sent. Simply execute GQRX and set it to the 433 frequency. When I press the button on the remote control, you can see that GQRX shows data being set at a slight offset. We can correct the offset by adjusting the frequency indicator to the proper one, in this case 433975. When I press on the button again, we can see we now are set on the correct frequency. Do keep in mind that you need to have your RF receiver connected to the computer in order to use GQRX. Now that the Raspberry Pi has rebooted, we can get back to it. Attach the copper wire to the fourth pin from the top left and execute the tune command on the Raspberry Pi with the frequency you want to jam. Now, what we're going to do is to jam slightly below the frequency of the codes being sent. Going back to GTRX, we'll see that now we have a lot more noise being sent. However, it is not exactly on the 433975. When we press the keys on again, we don't see the signal as it is being jammed. If we get to the Pi and we stop the jamming again, going back to GQRX will now show that the noise is gone and pressing the keys again is once again being able to be recorded. For the attack itself, we're going to use GNU Radio as it is capable of simulating RF related components. We'll set the sample rate for which we want our RF receiver to work on and we'll add a variable block that will define the frequency on which we want to listen. In our case, the frequency will be 433975, as this is the exact frequency on which the keys are transmitting. With this block added, we add another block called the Osmocom source. The Osmocom source is the receiver on which we will listen we'll add a file sync, which is simply the output of our received data, and we'll also add a frequency graphical sync in order to display it. Connect the three blocks and define the parameters, which are the frequency on the Osmocom source and the gain. In addition, we have to define the output file in the file sync in which we want to save the recorded data. We'll use a WAV file. Now, the last thing remaining is to configure the frequency display. Here we'll also set the frequency variable in the center of the display. With all the configurations ready, we can save the project and execute the program. When executed, 
a frequency display should pop up displaying the frequency data. When pressing the keys, we should see small jumps indicating send data. If we go back and execute the jamming code, we can see that the frequency is higher and the key presses are not detected. As soon as the jamming stops, the frequency drops again. Now that we understood how this works, we can re-execute the program again and actually record the codes being sent from the key presses. In an actual scenario, we'll want the receiver as close as possible to the keys while the jammer is near the car, in order for the jammer not to interfere with the recording and yet prevent the car from receiving the codes. All that is left is to create another program that will now send the recorded data instead of receiving it. We'll use the same variables as we did before. Keep in mind that because the codes were not received by the car because of the jamming, the data sent in the file will be considered by the car as if it was sent for the first time. In this case, we'll use the file source instead of the Osmocom source because we'll be reading the data from the file and transmitting it and we'll multiply it by a constant in order to make our signal a bit stronger. We'll also add a throttle block in order not to fry our CPU and we'll add the GUI frequency display as we did before while this time using the Osmocom sync as output. We connect the blocks again and configure the file source for us to use. This is the file to which we recorded the car unlock code. Now because the code might be slightly jammed, we will want to set the multiply constant to make the signal slightly stronger. And now same as before, we'll center the frequency for the display and select the frequency for the Osmocom sync to use. Remember that the Osmocom sync is the RF device. This time, when executed, the display will show the transmission of the frequency and the car key codes being sent. When received by the car, it will be unlocked. And this is how the process was done.